Active versus passive investing is one of the most contentious debates among investors. Tonight, we provide you with insights into this debate with 10X Investments' fourth annual retirement fund conference themed the investment time trial. What we're trying to do is to, is to bring the big decision makers in the retirement fund industry, which really is the trustees, be it trustees of large corporates or of large union funds, and we want to educate them rather than confuse them with complexity and even give market predictions of, you know, we just had Brexit, you know, how should I realign my portfolio, which we, we actually can't make strong investment decisions or good investment decisions on that basis. We want to really try and bring those decision makers together and educate them about how to make good long-term decisions for their members. Stephen Nathan, the founder and CEO of 10X Investments, has 20 years of local and international investment experience and was the first of the speakers. His presentation was themed plotting a safe path through the investing minefield. Who knows today how much does this 200 gram chocolate slab weigh when you buy it on the shelves? Okay, I heard 180 and I heard 150. Okay, so, so the correct answer is 150. I don't know how well you can, you can see that, but the, that's the answer. It's now 150 grams. And there actually is a term for this, it's called shrinkflation. So it's not easy to see that it's, that it's 150 grams. It's quite hard, you've got to look very hard to find what the weight is. But over the last five years, the price has increased by 50%, and the value, or what you get, has decreased by 50 grams. So the question is, how happy are you when you buy your chocolate and find out that you're now paying 50% more for 25% less. If you want to save for retirement, it's a pretty common objective in that when you get retirement age be 60 or 65, you want to ensure that you've got enough money to live on. So if someone's saving for retirement, it's something that uh, millions of other people are doing and the industry's been involved in for many decades. So as an industry, we should know the answer, and certainly we do know the answer, but the answer may not always be commercially as attractive for us as an industry. So the problem is that the industry has created lots of products that really are there to generate revenues for the company and for shareholders, and not necessarily to look after the best interest of the investor. So in South Africa, we have over 1,400 unit trusts. So you've got so much complexity and choice, and there's different investment strategies, and there's even more complex investment strategies. That causes most people to seek advice, which is another layer of fee, and there could be more conflicts of interest there. So the, the challenge that people have is that there's just so much choice, and they don't know what to do. So they tend to seek advice that is conflicted sometimes, it's very expensive, and often they invest in high fee funds which underperform the market. So that is what we call the investing minefield. And what we've done at 10X is to create a safe path through. So to give people an investment strategy that they know is always gonna be appropriate for their time horizon to, to retirement or to whenever they need their money. They're always gonna earn competitive returns, they're always gonna pay low fees, and they're always gonna have transparency. So it's really the, the safety of knowing that you are investing your money or your money that you're investing is really working hard for you. At 10X, we're not about the top performing portfolio because that we can't do and no one else can do that reliably. So we're not chasing performance and we're not offering different strategies because every strategy you provide, clients will give a different outcome. And we want people to get the single best outcome, not to have a one in five chance of doing well and a four in five or 80% chance of actually doing quite poorly. Zach Bezadenot, the head of South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa for S&P Dow Jones, took to the stage and shared research his firm has done on the performance of active managers, both locally and globally. I have the embarrassing job of um, showing you what's the, the actual results are versus active versus passive. So I don't know who, who we're really embarrassing, but we have to show these numbers. And we show these numbers globally. We've, we've done this for more than 10 years in the US. Uh, in the last two years, we've also started covering South Africa. Um, but the results don't lie. Um, over the last 15 years, um, the U.S. has really, really had some bad numbers coming through. Um, and the importance of that is if you see how big the U.S. is relative to anything that is listed in the world. So you can see um, sort of the big blue block is the S&P 500, you can call that, but it's really the U.S. listed space. 
making up more than 51% of all listed companies. You can see the sort of red slice there, that is the, the South African exposure. So we less than 1%, 0.74 if you want to really look at that. Um, what you'll also see is Europe sitting around 15%. Um, and then also you have the UK around 6%. So you can see almost pre-Brexit, uh, the, the, the Europe area was really about 20%. So between the US and Europe, um, about 70% make up all listed equities. Um, China, again, the, the yellow, yellow bar, but that is really what everybody is trying to outperform. That is the opportunity set available to all active managers or all investment professionals that they can either track or try and beat. Um, and that is really the game of, of, of what we're looking at. Now, within S&P, we actually cover this through various indices. We cover more than a million indices that we calculate per day. Um, so even in the index space, it can become very complex as everybody's got a different view of how they actually want to access this pie. You either want to just access a country or a region or a style of investing, but everybody has a, a different view of that, and that is why we can now sort of slice and dice this pie um, to exactly the, the needs of a pension fund or a particular investor. Now, to clarify, I didn't call them active versus passive because they're not, that doesn't really mean anything to anybody. You have to say it what it is. It's stock pickers. It's people that are picking stocks out of that pie and trying to be better than that. Stock pickers are really people that are trying to outperform the market. So they pick a basket of shares which they believe will perform better than the market. But what we've seen in the results through our SPIVA report is that the majority of those, and actually 70 to 80% of all active managers, underperform the market over five year periods. One of the tools Bezadenote used to come up with these outcomes is SPIVA, S&P indices versus active. It measures the performance of actively managed funds, investing in equities, as well as fixed income. The SPIVA scorecards are issued every six months in a number of markets around the globe. SPIVA has really scorecards that S&P um, do globally. Um, we cover currently eight regions, um, but what we do is it's basically S&P indices versus active managers. And we really show how these active funds have performed relative to the benchmarks in the industry. Now, the, the shocking results are that sort of 70 to 80% of all active managers underperform um, the market over a five-year period. The other scorecard that we do is called the persistency scorecard. Um, and that shows how persistent active managers can outperform year after year after year. And what we've seen over a five-year period, top quartile managers drop down to less than 0.5% that can do this persistently. So I think that's a very important message for trustees is to understand that trying to pick the winning fund manager is really hard. You might get it right, there's about a 1 in 5 or a 20% probability, but there's an 80% probability that you're going to get it wrong. And also what Standard & Poor's shared with us is that uh, past performance is no indicator of future performance. Because most people, trustees and uh, individual investors, they look for the fund that's done the best over the last five years and say, that's where I want to put my money. And what Standard & Poor's research shows is that fund managers that did well in the past actually don't do well in the future. And they showed us over a 15 year period that less than 1% of the funds were able to be in the top quartile or the top performers throughout that 15 year period. So the message that comes through very clearly is that if you want to maximize your returns, the best way to do that is to, is to invest in a low cost index fund because that's likely to beat 80% of other active managers out there. Robin Powell, director of Regis Media UK, has over 20 years experience as an international TV producer and presenter and has produced many award-winning documentaries on investing. He highlighted some international investing trends. So let's have a look now at stock selection. Picking stocks sounds seductively easy, but it's not. And one of the problems stock pickers face is that the best companies don't always make, in fact, they usually don't make the best investments. Now, Richard, Foster and Sarah Kaplan explored this issue in a book they wrote together called Creative Disruption. And they looked at the S&P 500 from 1957 to 1997. 
So of those original 500 constituents of the S&P 500 index, how many were still around in 1997? Just 74. Only 15% even remained on the list. And even small, in fact, far smaller percentage actually had outperformed the index. And they concluded in that book, searching for excellent companies was like trying to catch light beams. Investors typically have very short-term horizons, and the industry you know, almost preys on those short-term horizons. We think of you know three years or five years being a significant amount of time. But actually, most investors invest for at least 40 years. Young investors today, new graduates, are going to be investing you know, maybe 50, 60 years. That is a long time. It's almost impossible for an active fund manager to outperform over a period of 40, 50 years. As investors, we focus on you know, such short-term horizons. It, it really doesn't make sense. You know, it's almost impossible to tell whether outperformance over, say, three years is down to genuine skill or whether it's just purely random chance. If you look at the evidence, there's actually far more evidence for luck, simply luck, in the outperformance of actively managed funds as opposed to genuine skill. The purpose of passive portfolio management is to generate a return that is the same as the chosen index instead of outperforming it. Because this investment strategy is not proactive, the management fees assessed on passive portfolios or funds are often far lower than active portfolio management strategies. All three of the speakers discussed fees involved in passive and active management styles. The cost difference between active and passive investing can be huge. Clearly it differs from country to country. There are some countries which have relatively low charges. I say relatively low, they're still pretty high. In the United States, for example, who have the lowest active fund fees in the world, on the other end of the scale, you have countries like Chile, for example, which has a basic annual management charge of 4.5% before you even sort of factor in uh, transaction costs and so on. Yes, that's, uh, fees is something that uh, the industry doesn't talk about, but it's how they make their living. So most people are unaware of fees. Some people don't even think they pay any fees, yet that's the way the industry makes their living and we know that most people in the investment industry make very good livings even though a lot of funds underperform the market. So the challenge and the problem we have in South Africa and John Oliver said they have the same challenge in the, the US is actually getting simple fee disclosure. So people don't even know what the fees are because they're not transparent so it's very hard to find them out and even if someone has said to you well you're paying 2% in fees it doesn't sound like a big deal but 2% compounded over 40 years means that two-thirds of your fund value could actually be lost in fees. And that was where John Oliver said it's like termites. They're small termites. They, they seem small, but they can actually eat away your whole house and they can eat away your whole retirement fund. The active manager typically charges a higher fee up front and then they have a performance fee if they do outperform that where the um, passive managers are typically lower fees. ETFs you can actually pick up for around five basis points in the US for uh, the likes of an S&P 500 index um, tracker fund. The, um, the other thing that people need to be mindful of is in previous years when the markets were running at 20%, people didn't really feel um, the fee effect that much if you had to pay a lot for active management. But if we're working in a low return environment and you're only getting 2%, you're not willing to pay away a percent, so you're paying away half of your performance. So in low return environments, low cost, low fee um, tracker funds are probably a better option. In the second half of this investment story, what changes should you expect with your retirement funds? The main highlight there is postponing the requirement to annuitize for provident funds. And that comes on the back of the issues which were raised uh, during the beginning of the year. Why it's a concern we're not saving enough. If you zone in on gross um, uh, savings by household, then that's even more worrying uh, because households are literally saving at 0.1% of GDP. If you look at net, it's even more worrying because then that goes into the negative. Stay tuned for the view from National Treasury.
Welcome back to this highlight special on the fourth annual 10X Investments Conference 2016. The National Treasury's Olan Makubela gave us an update on government social security and retirement fund reforms. He also reminded us of the low current savings rate as a country. Just to kick off, um, I, we always think it's useful just to paint the macroeconomic um, picture. And I know Stephen has said before that um, it's not probably entirely true to always say that uh, South Africans are not saving and instead we should probably be worrying more about where our savings are going um, and how they will perform um, over time. And that's probably a fair comment, but just to give you a sense in terms of the numbers which are, um, are already there. So in terms of gross savings rate, we are unfortunately sitting at 15% um, of um, GDP. We are obviously reliant on foreign savings to finance investment, and as most of you would know, our chronic account uh, deficit. And if you compare us to our peers, like your BRICS um, countries, we are actually not doing that well. So if you look at a country like China, which effectively sitting on an average of 40% uh, growth savings um, in the last uh, couple of years. And that's interesting because China, including some of our uh, peers in the, in the BRIC um, uh, forum, tend, tend to also have some of the highest uh, growth rates. So the link between savings, investment, economic growth, and employment is quite important. If you zone in on gross um, uh, savings by household, then that's even more worrying, uh, because households are literally saving at 0.1% of GDP. If you look at net, it's even more worrying, because then that goes into the negative. Um, zone. And that has particularly been a concern for us as Treasury, given the implications of us uh, arguably not um, uh, saving enough. So the usual uh, concern around how do we manage then to deal with unexpected um, um, shocks to our expenditure. In fact, the only uh, component which is saving is coming from the industry. Government has not been uh, saving that well, um, and largely because of the global financial crisis, we had to um, obviously undertake uh, some kind of uh, stabilization of the economy, which essentially means uh, spending on infrastructure, etc. So on, 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 on a macro uh, scale, South Africa has struggled uh, in, in terms of savings, and that's the reason why we are trying to come up with policies to see how best we can encourage, uh, particularly household um, um, uh, savers, to, to, to be able to save and provide for that rainy day and also for their retirement. The South African government has looked into reforms that would help South Africans save more. This includes tax incentives. Last year we came up with regulations to enable the industry to provide what we call tax-free savings products. And the industry has actually done um, quite well because they have taken up that, um, that offer and opportunity and they have been marketing these products um, quite um, aggressively. So as government, we can use tax benefits to try and get people to do the, 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 the right thing. And so what we did with these particular products is to say they will not attract any uh, taxation. So whether it's uh, income tax, whether it's capital gains tax, as long as it's within the limits, it shouldn't attract any, any taxation. So that's the bid as government we can, we can, we can play. On the retirement side, we have um, come up with a number of um, proposals which have been contained in various um, papers. We have actually made some progress um, in, in, in the context of um, aligning some of the, 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 the taxation of various um, retirement products. And the most important thing there is that we have actually upped the, um, the retirement contribution cap to 27.5%, which effectively means you can take advantage of the cap by putting more money into your retirement fund and therefore having a significant portion of your income being protected from tax, which essentially means you will be able to take home a slightly higher salary. Compulsory annuitization is part of a broader set of reforms that were signed into law by South African President 
Jacob Zuma, in January that required Provident Fund members younger than 55 to annuitize two-thirds of their pension at retirement. Currently, Provident Fund members can take their whole benefit as a cash lump sum at retirement. And that comes on the back of the issues which were raised uh, during the beginning of the year that Provident Fund members were, were quite um, uh, uncomfortable having to be asked to annuitize or to buy an income with a portion of their retirement benefit when they reach um, retirement. So because of the, the concern which came up and, and, and the sense that um, we might not have consulted extensively on the issue, we felt that, um, the, and when, when I say we, as we discussed also with other stakeholders, that arguably the best way of dealing with the problem is to postpone that requirement to annuitize for the next two years so that we can start engaging at NEDLEC and also in that process to see how best we can work um, out um, new products which can start dealing with some of the concerns raised by the public around annuitization. So that's the main highlight of the Revenue Laws um, Amendment Act. I think this has been probably a low point for Treasury to speak because the reforms that were supposed to come into place uh, in March of this year, being 2016, which was the compulsory annuitization of provident funds, there was a lot of backlash and they had to put that off the table. So I think Treasury, they, they, they do have a bit of lost ground to make up because they've come through with a lot of good proposals, yet they haven't actually made it through into legislation and into practice in the industry. So it's a big challenge for National Treasury. They've got uh, lots of good initiatives, limited resources, and they've got vested interests from various parties. So what Treasury spoke about, the big issue that Treasury spoke about was the National Social Security Fund. So what the unions have said is that we're not talking about compulsory annuitization of provident funds until we know what's happening with Social Security. And Social Security is a very good objective because we want people to have a, a safety net if they're unemployed or they can't make financial ends meet. But it's very difficult because where does the money come from? And I think you could hear from Treasury's presentation is that you know, we're still doing the work to find out wh what kind of Social Security mechanism we can have, how we can fund that, and how we can make it equitable for everybody, including people that are going to be contributing to that. So it's a bit of a challenge for National Treasury. The unions, through the organised labour and employer organisation NEDLAC, objected to the implementation of the tax amendments from the reform proposals earlier this year, saying that retirement reform should not be done fragmented, but in conjunction with other reforms aimed at improving the social security system. The Parliament has put the National Treasury on notice to come up with an agreement on annuitisation within the next two years. Uh, it's a bit difficult, we, so we, we, we are trying to um finalize the paper. It does require um, engagements with other government departments uh, and hopefully we will be able to um, release the paper in the, in, in the next few weeks or months if possible because we also, we also need to deliver on our commitment to Parliament which is that we must try and, and, and get the paper released as soon as possible. South Africa has its own challenges when it comes to retirement reforms but we're not alone. Goldman Sachs banker Greg Smith, who four years ago announced that he was leaving Goldman Sachs in a harshly worded open letter in the New York Times, joined in on the discussion via Skype to share his insights on the industry in America. Uh, so this first screen I wanted to show you guys is uh, what a Baltimore public school teacher will find on their first day on the job. And this largely is going to be the thing that they're going to be relying on to retire. Uh, you know, I, I know uh, we speak about the U.S. as kind of this beacon of doing things a lot better than the rest of the world. But I, I thought I would I'd just give you guys a little bit of a sense of, of the, the size of the problem that exists in this country. Uh, there is a $10 trillion difference between what Americans have saved and what they're going to need to retire. Uh, and... Uh, that, that difference exists because public pensions and guaranteed pensions largely gone away. Social security is not going to be enough for po most people. Uh, so some of these stats startle people. Uh, one third of America has zero savings, not one cent saved. Uh, the average American has $6,000 of total savings. Uh, and 
The third point I wanted to make is the average American over their lifetime will pay $150,000 of 401k fees and 90% of people in this country do not know those fees exist. Yes, I think it's great that uh, we had uh, Greg Smith, former Goldman Sachs banker, who is now with a retirement fund advisory company using a lot of the same principles as uh, 10X. And he opened our eyes because often we look at the US and we see the tremendous inflows into in index funds and we think the US, they're much more sophisticated than us and they're doing the right thing by getting out of underperforming high cost active funds into low cost index funds. And while that trend is true, what Greg showed us is there's still 80 million Americans Americans that are on individual retirement plans sponsored by their employer, but once they're enrolled, they get a very complex menu of investment options where there's sometimes 30, 50 investment options, all with complicated names, no descriptions, and people are having to make these decisions on their own, and they're making really bad decisions. So I think it was an eye-opener for us that the challenges we face with complexity, with uh, high costs, with poor transparency, is not only a South African problem, it's still a problem in the US, and I think there's a lot of work that 10X, the industry, and the regulators can do, and trustees as well, to better educate and empower themselves so they make good decisions that look after their own retirement futures rather than someone else's.